May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So um, you might want to quickly grab your prayer books because we are finishing, we are finishing off today the Nicene Creed and we'll all be thoroughly orthodox in our understanding of everything once we're done, won't we? <laughs> no, probably not. Uh, so, so if you, remember, if you recall, last week we spoke briefly about uh, the Holy Spirit in one sermon um, and kind of the relationship of the Spirit to the Father and to the Son and the role of the Spirit in leading prophetic lives. And I now want to finish with the last section. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. That's, a, that's the last paragraph there on page 123 in your uh, green prayer books. And I want to start with where I often end up, one of the first places I often come to in this. And this, this is, usually we do this uh, in baptisms and things, and we talk about one holy Catholic church. And people go, I thought you were Anglican. Uh, and, and we are. We are. But what the word Catholic means, it, in, in the kind of shallowest sense, it means universal. That is, to do with the whole world. And sure, part of the church that's all around the world in many different places and forms and shapes. Uh, yeah, that's true. We are a part of that. Uh, but for me, if that's all it is, it's barely worth mentioning. For me, it's an understanding of the way the church reacts to and understands God's work. So, in, in the person of Jesus Christ, and this is the easiest place to enter into this conversation, do we understand what Jesus did in his life, his death and his resurrection as having only local implications or universal implications? And we believe universal implications. Implications that have more to do than just those couple of people that happen to meet Jesus. That means more than just for those of us that happen to have been lucky enough to hear the stories of God and let them sink into us so that we are transformed. The work of Jesus has universal implications. This is true of all that God does. It has impact beyond its immediate environment. And that's important, because that means the church has a mission to more than just the local. Apostolic. Connecting us to the teachings of the first, the first people who came together to be a church. Those first students of Jesus who, who had the courage to turn around and tell the stories to others. And connect ourselves to them. Now that doesn't mean that we have to try and do church in exactly the same way they did church. And I'm reminded of, the, you know, there's a number of jokes about light bulbs and how many uh, sort of people does it take to screw in a light bulb? Well, there are no light bulbs mentioned in the Bible. Um, <laughs> no, no, we do church differently, but we're connected to the way they do church and think about church and teaching. And that's not buildings it's about community because the church uh, did you did you used to sing this song um the, the church is not a building sorry the church is not a building the church is not a steeple the church is not a resting place the church is the people did you sing that song well if you didn't you should uh, <laughs> not because it's it's beautiful or anything like that but because it's really important uh, because it, it helps us understand it helps small children understand that this bricks and mortar isn't the church it's the gathering of the people in response to God that is the church so uh, we need to remember that we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins um, have you watched the Da Vinci Code yeah that's a great movie I love them the book was cracker I read it in about a weekend a lot of fun totally unrealistic 
Um, my biggest problem with it is the map, actually, because there's some horrible map in it. But anyway, uh, the history is fairly poor as well. But there's one interesting thing in it. They talk about Constantine, uh, who's only baptized on his deathbed, and this is seen as some sort of, he was forced to baptize. Yeah, no. Um, what they did back then is they delayed baptism as long as possible because the idea was you'd be baptized, in baptism you'd be cleansed of all your sins, and then it, you could die, and you'd be pure, and you'd get straight to heaven. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But uh, uh, it, that was the thinking, which is why he's baptized so late in life. He's playing, he's playing, he's playing the odds. Um, you know, I'm on my death, but I won't have a lot of opportunity to misbehave. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. It's baptism into the church. Now, that doesn't mean we will never sin again. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> he was. Oh, it would be nice to be perfect, I think. I don't know. <laughs> but um, we're baptized. We're cleansed of our sins. And we continue to live into that baptism, understanding that God continues to be forgiving in nature. And we're constantly called to be transformed, because baptism is about transformation. It's about death and resurrection. That, that, that's what it's all about, which conveniently takes us on to the very next line. We look for the resurrection of the dead. I don't know what to do with this one. Do we think a literal resurrection of the dead? Do we think literally people hopping up out of the graves and wandering around? Are we going to have enough atoms to get away with that? To reassemble everybody's molecules? And um, will we be resurrected in, in, in the form that we were when we died? Or will, you know, will it be when you were at your fittest and healthiest? I don't know what to do with that. I'm going to, but this is where I land, at the moment, <coughs> at the moment. I look at the world. I look at the world and I think about how much power death seems to have. You see it everywhere. I see it a lot in advertising. I see it a lot in advertising. You, the clue is, the people they put on billboards are young and beautiful which tells you they're frightened of the opposite of that, those who are approaching death. Death has a lot of power in the world. It has a lot of power to make people do things, you know. <coughs> What's going to happen when you die? Um, and I, I've had people come and ask me this question when they were trying to convert me to Christianity. You know, do you know what's going to happen to you when you die? This stage of my life, I'm thinking of being cremated, but uh, I don't know, really. Um, but it's, 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 it's a fear game. And here's the thing resurrection means we don't need to be afraid of death. Resurrection means death has lost its sting. It's not that you won't die, but that it need not have a whip to drive us. Death has lost its sting. And so we get to make choices based on, not on fear, but on hope. And hope is very powerful. Hope is very powerful because it keeps on coming and keeps growing. So do, we, do I think it's literal or metaphor? I, I don't know, but death has lost its sting and for that I am grateful and for the life of the world to come. Yesterday I was teaching RI in a school, and the, one of the kids says, um, Andrew, do you think Jesus would be happy with the world the way it is? And I, 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 oh, I felt conflicted. You know, one, you know, it's great that kids worry about these things, and it's terrible that kids worry about these things. You know, this kid's in like grade five. He shouldn't be watching the news. That's that scary, man. Should have like an R rating. Parents shouldn't put kids in front of that. 
that's scary stuff. On the other hand, on the other hand, the world is a much better place now than it used to be. I launched into my tirade. I don't know if I've shared this with you. So, you know the, the Millennium Development Goals that the United Nations created a while ago? They were created as aspirational goals. You know, pipe dream. Imagine we could one day do this. And 15 years later, mostly it's ticked off. It's 15 years! It's nothing! And the amazing <coughs> things we've done in the world. So they come back and they do a whole new set. The Sustainable Development Goals are called these days. So the world has, has improved significantly. But there is still work to be done. So that all might have life and have it in abundance. Now by abundance I don't mean everybody should have lots of stuff. Because stuff doesn't give you life in abundance. I, you know, it's um, they say money can't buy happiness, and to a certain extent that's true. I mean, poverty doesn't guarantee happiness either. Um, but enough is enough. And when you've got enough, then other things start to matter. The things that start to matter are the richness of our relationships with each other and with God. The things that start to matter are the ways in which we treat others. The things that start to matter are the ways we impact on the world around us. That's abundant life. When we've got enough that we can start to value. And we don't have to just struggle every day. So the challenge for us is to think in a Catholic sense. To think how might we impact on all of God's creation and to act with the people around us so that our interactions with them might give them a true sense of life and they might not fear death but might make decisions in hope as we do in the name of God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.